fantastic to see such a good crowd for our last session. So that's a great tick for the organisers that you're all still here. So thank you. If you haven't been at any panel discussions before today, um, my name's Sophie Scott. I'm the medical reporter for ABC and I'll be hosting this um, discussion. It's always um, interesting to hear the, the, the perspectives of the state and local representatives when it comes to activity-based funding. And we're going to be hearing lots of really good specific examples of how it works. Uh, the panel discussion will go for an hour. I'll ask questions for about half of that. And then I really want you in the audience to ask questions. So please uh, ask it through the app, or if you'd rather just raise your hand in the last sort of 10, 15 minutes, there'll be the chance for that as well. Um, again, if you're on Twitter, hands up who's on Twitter in the audience. Good. So if you can tweet, just remember the, um, the hashtag is ABF19 and we'd love to get lots of tweets out there and get this conversation out to a broader audience than just the people in this room. So uh, I'll give you a bit of a break. You don't need to stand up. Actually, no, I think I will get you to stand up, actually. Everyone stand up. Panelists, stay seated. And I'll introduce all our um, guests. You can give them a, a standing ovation that they deserve. <laughs> Please welcome uh, Tony Cunningham, the Senior Director, Healthcare Purchasing and Funding Branch for Queensland Health. She leads the costing, purchasing, funding models <laughs> for Queensland. Um, now, we're in an election campaign. There's been a few candidates who have had to take off away their candidacy at the last minute. So we've had a late scratching as well. Not for any, They haven't done anything wrong, they just had to be somewhere else. So uh, filling in for Denise Ferrier is Richard Belitho, and he's been with the Department of Health and Human Services for 19 years. He's currently the Acting Assistant Director of Funding Policy and Integration here in Victoria. Uh, welcome, Richard. Round of applause. Uh, uh, we have Dr. Amanda Ling. She's the Deputy CEO of Jundalup Health Campus, and she has a wealth of knowledge and experience gained from a diverse background in public and private health. Welcome, Amanda. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Rob Anderson, who's the Executive Director of the Western Australian Department of Health in charge of information and system performance. So welcome, Rob. Thank you. Everyone can sit down. Thank you very much. So, I thought we'd start um, on a positive note. I thought we'd start on a positive note by asking the panel, um, when it comes to activity-based funding, what's working well in state and local hospitals? So uh, why don't we start with, um, who'd like to get going with that? So what's, what's working well? Tony? <laughs> um, right now, what is, what is working well and what continues to work well is, is the discussion and uh, quality of the information we're actually getting around all of that data. So, because I was in the first round of very rough implementations back in 2006-ish, mm -hmm. whenever it was first coming up, it was interesting times, and the data was very limited. And so I think what's working well is still that data collection, so data counting, and uh, that is going well. There's lots of room to improve, mm -hmm. but it's also a... Um, great in terms of a common language and how we're actually discussing um, the health services with our and HHSs. Mm -hmm. What do you think is yeah. going well when it comes to activity-based funding? Well, I'd have to agree with, with Tony. I think one of the, the, the big things with ABF, and of course people will know that ABF has been in Victoria for 26 years, uh, in particular in the inpatient setting, and I think that the benefits that are coming through is that we're getting uh, improvements in quality of data. Uh, I th certainly think there's a way to go in that regards, uh, and uh, ideally the consistency in that in that data, which enables us to have a greater understanding and comparability not only within jurisdictions but also across jurisdictions. Uh, and as things like the cost data also improve, it's giving us that flexibility to start thinking about where we might move with the next generation of funding. Um, and I mean, there's obviously other benefits in terms of efficiencies with length of stay reductions and things like that. But certainly, I think data is, from a national perspective, one of the big, big improvements. Amanda, what are, what are you seeing from where you, you sit? So I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Um, and I'll just um, explain. I was also the clinical lead for the ABF implementation from the WA Department of Health. So this is a, a comment from there, is that 
we've been able to use that data, so I agree with everybody else, but we've used that data to drive clinical practice so we understand what's being done and where it's being done and how it's being done and the, you know, the complications, but also some of the good things that come out of it. So I think that that's been a real benefit for WA to understand that and see how we can use that data to plan services going forward and uh, plan it in a way that's actually meaningful for the communities that we serve. Rob, what about you? I think, um, by and large, you've stolen my answers, but I think I could be a cynic and say it's nice to see the Commonwealth contribution has increased in line with Certainly not as far as we thought it would go in the original NHRA, but it's, yep. it's up there and it's going, so that's good. I think definitely the quality of data and the ability for us to look across jurisdictions. Um, certainly in WA, I had this question a couple of years ago, I think I gave the same answer. WA being so small, it is important for us to be able to look to our, our other jurisdictions yeah. and see what, what's what in those jurisdictions so that we can use that for benchmarking clinical improvement. And then to develop things like outcome measures and. Um, which we'll talk about in the future, but you know, in isolation that would be terribly difficult. And I think when um, Richard, when I was speaking to Denise on the phone, she was saying that activity-based funding works really well for episodic care, but not so much for dealing with chronic conditions. And given that so many patients these days have chronic conditions, then that must be a bit tricky. Oh, it certainly is, and, and I think that's, and I know that Shane mentioned this at the, at the first discussion mm -hmm. about uh, activity-based funding does have uh, certain incentives that it, that it puts forward and one of those is that um, it, it's based on episodic uh, occasions of service and, and uh, admissions and as a consequence that's the, in, that's the incentives that we put into the system from a funding perspective. Uh, what it uh, struggles with is, is dealing with patients with chronic conditions that may not necessarily be suited for that, um, that form of funding arrangement. and trying to create some degree of flexibility in how we might fund uh, different cohorts of patients. ABF is fairly rigid in terms yeah. of uh, you try to fit everybody into a, a particular model rather than that degree of flexibility. I think, I think from a departmental perspective, not talking from the actual provider's perspective, you work with what you've got and at the moment the, the episodic and the actual wealth of information we have got allows us to actually devise new ways of funding, whereas previously we couldn't, it was just block and on faith that something would happen. Um, so I think it's, while it's, it's sort of rigid in one hand, I actually think it's highly flexible because you can bundle all of the different services to right. create the profile that you want the health services to provide, but it also actually provides a language in which you can talk to, we have a, a large non-government organisation contracting um, group that uh, is linked with the, with the teams. And that's talking about, well, how can we change the language about what we're actually looking for them to do yep. on a basis in, a, in the community setting. So it is actually, um, it's even driving better and improved um, service delivery, we think, because, because of the, uh, the way it's structured. So I wanted to, um, as I mentioned, I want this session to be really looking at some specific initiatives that the um, different states and territories are, have introduced. So let's talk about now what specific initiatives are being rolled out for value-based healthcare. Um, we might just start with maybe with, a, with Amanda and Rob. Can you talk about the, the hip fracture um, payments model? Uh, I'm going to start with actually talking about what we did and Rob will then answer some of the sort of the data questions. Um, this started five years ago and we believed in WA that incentives and telling people what is best practice is better than penalties. And I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of penalties because um, it doesn't necessarily drive the behaviour you want. It will drive out the some of the behaviour you don't want. So we uh, in WA followed the, um, the British um, BPTs and I think someone was talking about um, best practice tariffs and we followed the tariff. And we wanted the hip fracture one, and it was evidence-based, and we knew that there was a lot of evidence from Britain it would work, and we had a problem with it. We knew that relative to the UK, we didn't have the same outcomes, and, and in the very raw terms, immortality. And we introduced it. We had a, a, a premium payment for five years. It was $200. It was not enough to influence a hospital when you've got two or 300 patients the biggest cohort is, um, uh, I think, about 450 patients in one hospital. Not a large amount of money. It's The money stopped in 2017. The improvements have continued. So I think that that's, but it was data collection. It paid for the data collection. 
So we've introduced all the bundles um, and seven years down the track, the uh, mortality is reduced, especially at 120 days. We've got a very much reduced mortality rate. We're the best performers in terms of um, um, uh, out of ED into um, theatre and pain relief. The, um, and, and also too, we, did, we will report this now through the hip fracture um, registry, which is run out of Prince of Wales. And for a few of you, um, uh, West Australia and Jackie Close from Prince of Wales uh, presented this at this conference, I think, a couple of years ago. But um, uh, w one of the things that made the, a big difference for us was being able to understand you know, what was going on and the data we had. So I think it's been a really, really good exercise in understanding what's good care following through with it and doing it as a statewide model. Uh, the last thing I was going to mention, in terms of data, we set up a portal, so everybody sees the portal. So all hospitals with hip fractures all put the data on the portal. I mean, it, we're easy because we're only six sites who do it and everybody meets every month as a collaborative to say, what are we doing? How can we make it better? And I think that's been a really good example of how we can improve care. Rob? Um, well, you've pretty much nailed it. I mean, <clears throat> from a system manager point of view, it was, and you were a system manager at that time. <coughs> that time, it's a very small amount of money to put towards this, but the the impacts have been enormous. So, so why do you, why do you think it worked so well? If the if the incentive wasn't to earn money, why why do you think it had the impact that it well, had? I think as we've heard in plenty of the presentations, clinicians, like I think everyone in this room and most people in general, have the best interests of patients at heart, and and are in the the job for for that reason. So. The pushback you would normally get if you said to clinicians or hospitals, look, we want you to start collecting all these additional things and we're going to start looking at all your outcomes would be, who's paying for this? And so the $200 really is immaterial to the, their budgets, to the yeah. state budget, it's, it's nothing. But what it did do is it paid for that data collection and for that um, portal. Um, and we now have this enduring data set, which is it's just, it's, it's so deep in terms of the, um, the quality of the information. But also, as, as Amanda said, the, the, the results continue. We are leading the nation now, and it is such a simple thing to do. And as we discussed on the phone last week, yeah. it, you have to have a real, putting my performance hat on now, you have to have a real balance between sticks and carrots. Yeah. And if you just keep whacking people, it's gonna, they're going to lose interest. The conversation is going to go one way, and they're going to walk away, and then you kind of run out of sticks because you can only hit so many people so many times. This is a very small carrot, but the, the benefits are enormous. And I think that's something we need to consider as we go forward in the value based healthcare um, conversation. And with clinicians, how difficult or easy was it to get them on board when you proposed this, this new system? Uh, it, was a, it was actually relatively easy when you think about the, what we're trying to do, because it was a change of practice, not the data collection, that was the issue. Uh, and it was the geriatricians led it. So um, a lot of people in here, there's a few geriatricians who know Hannah Seymour. Now, I wouldn't mess with Hannah Seymour yeah, if I were you. So let's be honest about that. But she's, uh, she's fabulous and she's charismatic and she drove it. But the big challenge and the big win for us is she managed to convince the orthopods that this was a good idea. Because mm -hmm. in actual fact, the orthopods didn't want to do more than put the screw in or put the hip replacement in. So when the geriatrician said, and I will look after the patient, then, and we actually delivered that, that's what made the difference. So there was in something in it for everybody. The geriatricians mm. had a better time because these pa patients weren't so metabolically unstable and the orthopods had a better time because they didn't have to manage the patients who were metabolically right. unstable. So it was a bit of a win-win. And from a system perspective, it was a total win. So I guess that's clinician-led um, and it was about what, what do we all get out of it and try and focus on those sides of it. I think uh, talking, adding on to that in terms of clinician-led, the conversation has moved on with the introduction of we've been on the value-based healthcare journey, looking about how can we better engage with um, with our health providers, and the discussion truly changed when the consumer or patient was actually introduced into that conversation, and it was actually about what is it that you're seeking from the service with clinicians, and we're just the enablers, like. If that's the right thing to do, we should do it. And there's, if it's the compelling, um, you know, no one wants to uh, create a situation that actually doesn't work for everybody. But how do we get everybody actually on the same um, page. Yeah. on the same page? And it was get, and we have quite a lot of um, consumer representatives who join in the discussion of how 
how will we change our model of care? And then we're just, as the enabler, how mm. will we fund it to make sure that that is possible? So just going back to Rob and Amanda for a moment. So given the success of this particular um, the system that you have with the hip fractures, what are you um, what are you looking at now? Are there other areas you're looking at to sort of do this in other parts of the health system? Uh, no, <laughs> but it's something we do need to look at. I, I don't. Know, everyone in the room was at that presentation yesterday morning about the problems uh, collection in in England, and I. I might have misheard, but I think it was a similar type of approach that they pay essentially for the process to collect um, that information. And I think that's another example of basically what we did and um, something that I'll take back to Perth and say, you know, because we've been struggling around how do you get PROMs into the performance space, how do you get it into a funding conversation? Yeah. And maybe that's the start of that is to start incentivising the collection of that um, through that similar approach. One of the things that has, has started happening um, at a local clinical level, when we built this database many years ago, we made it a little bit flexible, um, which you know at the time seemed ambitious, but now I think I was actually quite clever, so thank you. And, um, but one of the things, it meant that I could collect different um, data sets. So we're st we've um, started on the stroke data set. What's interesting is we've now, all our stroke centres are collecting data on the data set um, and we haven't asked for money. So I think people just understand it's the same process, we're doing it again, we just want the stroke. Um, a lot of people are using the same, it's the same software, so, it's, so we're using the same, some of us are using the same people to load our data, but it hasn't, it doesn't seem to have occurred to anyone to ask Rob for the money yet, got but no. I'm working on it. I'm broke, I've got no money. <laughs> so. He says that all the time. <laughs> and Amanda, when you and I were talking, you were saying with that data, it's so having the transparency so that everyone else can see everyone else's data has been really crucial as well. That's been crucial, and, and Rob probably ought to tell, tell everyone about the link data set because that's that's been really important to our journey. Yeah, I mean every state's got data linkage now. We've in WA we've got 25 years or 50 years. You 50, tell me. 50 years. Of 25 years of the, the unit that um, reports to me in data linkage. It is a fantastic resource, and it, but it's, it is underutilised. But um, that link data and the fact that we have a unique medical record number allows us to track patients across the system. And uh, I know a lot of states grapple with this this issue. And that kind of um, it, it all comes back to data, doesn't it? It all comes back to collecting quality data and using it. And I think if you go back to your original question, ABF, that that has driven a lot of this. The link data, not so much. We've already always done that. But it, it all comes back to good quality data. And I think that was one of the things with the hip fracture patients, because we have a unique medical record number across the whole city, so Perth has the same number, it meant that when we were tracking the hip fracture patients and trying to evaluate outcomes later, we could see by tracking the URMs um, what their subsequent um, medical journey or hospital based journey was. So we could see every admission, every outpatient, all off the one t um, PAS system. Mm. Uh, and so it was easier on the evaluation process to do it. We didn't have to ask somebody for the data. We could just right. look at it and drop it ourselves. So it was all there for you to see. Correct. So would that work in a, in a bigger states where you may not have that so easily access to, to see what happens to the patients as they go through different parts of the journey? Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does work. There, there are, as, as Rob said, there, there are linkage teams in each state. The, um, the sharing rules is mm. something we've got to overcome at the moment. So with back and forth between yeah. the, the team and the hospitals. Richard? I was just going to say, we, we have a slight problem. We've got 86 LHNs or health services, <laughs> so uh, with all slightly different nuanced ways of collecting data, but we're certainly working with our data group to uh, improve that quality and certainly we've got a data linkage team and uh, some of the work that they're doing is is quite exciting in terms of being able to link the patient and just to follow that pathway. That's good. So um, we might just ask Tony now, so um, can you take us through, we've heard about the hip, the hip fracture um, payment model but you've also got some really innovative funding models as well for a couple of different things. So talk us, take us through the, the one for the chronic kidney patients. How, why did you choose that and how's it going? So we didn't choose it, the clinicians did. Um, it's, and it started a couple of years ago. So again, uh, it was seen that there was a potential um, disparity of, and equity of service and access and quality of care. So if you were having a 
kidney failure, you would be put straight onto dialysis. That was your only option, and you might have to travel an awful long way to get that. Right. So that was kind of the the problem statement, and the solution was to look at where other models and um, get um, a probably an outside of the local context. So it wasn't competing between two clinical views. There was an external uh, clinician coming into Queensland and actually discussing what needed to happen or what recommendations might be made around it. The change, and it was called the actual, it was called the chronic you know, renal funding model change, but really it was actually about changing the models of care and devising what should be the model of care and the quality of service that patients should expect in different regions. Right. So that's a very big shift. And um, con consumers have been in involved in all of those uh, discussions as well. And you know, you hear about, well, really, I want a dialysis unit in town X. And we're going, mm, we're trying not to do that. We're trying yeah. to change what actually happens. So you don't actually need dialysis. You're picked up sooner. So it picked up earlier in the disease And process. a lot of prevention goes into that. But that's about the, the primary care. And we've got to get our house in order. And then it goes, well, hey, hello, what, who are we getting? So it's sooner sooner to transplantation rather than dialysis. So, and what's the impact of the, this um, program? Fantastic collaboration across many, many clinicians. And uh, they've developed actually a range of models of care across eight streams of their particular practice. And with that, um, it's now our job to work out what is the gap analysis and what the funding model might look like to support it. And also um, having a discussion with our minister and general department and our clinical um, uh, hospitals executive to come to an agreement that we will actually ring fence the money. You can't use it for anything else. You so must that'll be quarantined invest. for that? That's the intention. That's the, that's the next that's challenge, the challenge point. Yeah. Yes. So we've got a bit of a shadow view for next year, which is about the models of care change. Um, but then can we truly make it that the, the lot of money we invest in that um, those patients actually change what happens for them and, and their outcomes. There's some other things with Tony, but Richard, did you have anything to add at this point? Yeah, I, I guess um, the big one for us, of course, is the Health Links project, mm -hmm. that, or the program that uh, I know has been subject of a couple of discussions and sessions already today, uh, in the last couple of days. And I think uh, the Health Links is, is just something where we've tried to look at the funding differently. Uh, that uh, it's actually got, uh, it's a program that doesn't actually give any extra money to the health services. Uh, it's all done within the what was the existing funding arrangements, but we've exempted from our recall policy, which means that health services have a bit more flexibility and, and it's not going to um, any better outcomes in terms of inpatients. Uh, admissions will not necessarily result in a reduction in their funding. So we've kept that sort of incentive in the model and, and certainly because uh, we're piloting it, uh, we've probably got those health services that are more keener to be in this space. Uh, and certainly um, meeting with the clinician groups in particular has been very positive. They are very enthusiastic about these sorts of models and having that degree of flexibility in terms of how they provide the treatment to their patients. And um, just travelling to, to some of those hospitals and hearing of the patient stories mm -hmm. um, in particular um, gives us the indication that we're heading on the right track. Well, excellent. We've got lots of good questions coming in on the app, so thank you for that. I'll, I will try to get through as many of them as possible. But before we start to go through that, I just thought I'd ask Tony, um, she talked about her kidney um, disease model, but she, you've also got some um, great initiatives when it comes to dealing with pelvic mesh as well, and that's something I've done a lot of stories on, so I'm keen to hear what you're doing. So, um, again, it, it started from the uh, need to have a model of care in place. There was no uh, holistic model of care in the state. So you'd get access for pain management or particular surgery or any anything else you actually might needed, and it was disconnected. So um, the, uh, actually driven out of our quality and safety team was, uh, they, they brought together cl consumers, clinicians, and it was to drive a, a, a total holistic model of care. And then it was pitched to our health services about who would like to run it, because it's highly controversial. Um, and the, it became a statewide model in terms of referral process and how would people get into this particular process. And my administrative hat, I'd be in there going, batting up saying, it's not about surgery, it's about all of the services that you need to have wrap around 
uh, the woman as and their family really. Uh, so like psychosocial care and yeah, other things. Yeah. Like that. So we did. We've we, it's kicked off this year and it's um, a mixed model of um, ABF and uh, so it's bundled in with a like a grant funding to actually um, start it off because we need to evaluate what is actually going to work and what will be and there's a, a data collection that's gone with it in terms of patient reported um, outcomes. Outcomes. Oh, so, that's great. Which yeah. And, uh, which I think they will make public anyway. So <laughs> it would be good that we do capture it. Yes. Mm. So let's go to a couple of questions from the app because we've got quite a few coming in. Uh, so Julia Hume asks, could panel members identify an ABF initiative that they've seen another jurisdiction implement that they'd like to implement in their own backyard? So who would like to say? In other <laughs> words, have you seen something happen in another state or territory? You think, oh, that, that cool. sounds interesting. I might try it. We might like to try it here. So I'll take that, this one. So I, I'm now deputy CEO of a, a hospital in the northern suburbs of Perth. We're 35 k's up the, the freeway. I'm also a PPP, public-private partnership. So that um, adds some complexities which Rob and I can argue about when we're not in front of everybody else. <laughs> but Health Links has been something that we've been really passionate about and we've been trying to get that up. I've been trying to get that up for three years. And uh, with Silver Chain and with WA Primary Healthcare Network, and to see Victoria do it and actually start getting some runs on the board, I nearly jumped on the Silver Chain boys last night. I think they thought, "What's this woman doing?" <laughs> I let them <laughs> over across the table and said, "Do I want to talk to you?" But I think that that's now given me. Uh, I was just about to give up. To be honest, I thought this is too hard. Um, I'm driving from bottom up, and a lot of stuff comes bottom up. Um, mm. Gains the attention of the health department. Hip fractures did that, and that's how it got legs. And so I'm now going to go back, and I am going to bash Rob till he just <laughs> says, "Just make her go away." <laughs> Persistence is the, obviously the key. What about Richard and Tony? The other things you've seen that you'd like to? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? I, I must admit, we I was, won't I was, hold you to I, it. No, I think we collaborate a lot and say, "What are you doing in this space? Um, is it something we should be should be doing at the same yeah, time?" And, and health links. We've spoken to you over the last couple of years, going, "Watch how that's actually running, and can, how the evaluation comes out." Really. Yeah, and, and certainly, I think there's been a lot of interest um, about the health links. And whilst it's early days, certainly the evaluation is something that you know would obviously be interested to see what comes through mm. um, after the first 18 months or so. But I know that one of the things that we've struggled with at times is how we fund dialysis mm -hmm. um, in particular. And uh, for the Victorians, they'll, they'll know the, the hub and spoke model um, when I mentioned that, and that's mm. had some difficulties. And I think we'd be certainly interested to see what happens mm. with, the, with the Queensland model and see how that might be something that can be transported into Victoria. And Tony? Um, I think we pinch whatever we can, yeah. and it <laughs> happens frequently. I think in terms of our um, state model, we have a lot of localizations. So we have the, the base model and then a whole bunch of plus, 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 plus. Mm. And when you match that out, and then there's a big negative, which is the um, hospital acquired complications ad adjustment. But the, so we'd keep constantly on the lookout and going, mm. do we think that would actually work here? It, what's it, what message does it send to be annoying? Because mm. it is maybe an, another data collection. Um, or is it something we actually just want to flag so we can measure it? So we'll build it into the model because, in actual fact, we think it's important. Uh, you know, the stroke um, care, you know, the actual um, addition of funding for patients who are managed in a particular way through mm. the stroke, uh, stroke pattern. And a hospital would be, you know, delisted because they didn't follow a particular pattern. And we'd mm. say, okay, you're not getting that money anymore. So there were, there just, uh, there's many aspects, and we're always on the lookout for something that makes sense mm. in terms of trying to put a flag about something we want someone to pay attention to. Yeah. As a, that's our job, I think, as funding levers in the system. So we've got an interesting question here that we might take from the audience, and this is from Anna Flynn, who writes, what would be the panellists' one key priority for the new 2020 National Health Reform Agreement? So if you had to write a list of your key priorities, what would you put at the top of that list? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Tricky Take one. off the cap. Well, well, let's start with no you. Um, <coughs> data sharing. And by that I mean Commonwealth data as well. Right, so, so transparency again. Yeah, access to the data. Yep. If we want to move forward in the preventative health space and build those links with primary health, we need to understand what's going on outside of our Your own control. Environment. Yep. yep. 
good point, Richard. And, and I think building on from, you know, I'd certainly say that data is, is the big issue going forward. Uh, so that we do have that holistic view of what's happening to the patients and their patient journey in both the, the primary and the secondary and tertiary yep. environments. Mm -hmm. However, since we'll, we'll be cumulative rather than uh, <laughs> concurrent, um, I, I guess probably the next thing for me is, is having that flexibility in the national model environment in terms of bringing in innovative funding models mm -hmm. um, at, rather than uh, the, some of the problems that we have at the moment in getting them through. So I think a bit of that leap of faith uh, to let's see if we can try and, and get these to work rather than have to wait for the evidence. I think um, the funding model uh, would be a big one for me. And Tony or Amanda? Yeah, I was, I was going to be quite controversial and say just hand the money to the states and then we'll manage all of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a wish list, list <laughs> so you may as well go, go all out. I just got the whole lot. Yeah. Amanda? <laughs> That's so my opinion, by the way, not the a state's opinion. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes, sir. Chatham House rules, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's all in. So I'm going to take a bit more of a clinical approach again and, and have money set aside to look at what, where the evidence is, how we use that data to do the evidence of where we can have the most impact. What are the cohorts of patients that are not so far down the road that we've missed the boat, but you know, we can actually put in a reasonable intervention we, and we work out how to fund that intervention because it'll be multidisciplinary, multimodal, multi-site, multi-everything. And then how do we wrap innovative funding around but specific cohorts? And if we all do it together, we tend to learn more about it. And there's plenty of groups that we can kind of work together with. Okay. So we might just go back to a specific example of a, of a funding model that we were actually just talking about earlier uh, before we came in here, and that's bariatric surgery. So Tony, can you explain to the audience uh, what happens in your jurisdiction and then maybe we'll go to some other panellists to talk about what happens there? So the, I guess the controversial issue when, we, when it was first raised, um, from my perspective, it, very different for the clinical uh, view, was that there seemed appeared to be inequity of access to um, getting bariatric surgery. So we created a clinical prioritisation criteria across the state. So no matter where you were, you could actually access it. And one of the main elements to be added to the criteria was that the patient um, had type 2 diabetes and it would be something that would actually lead them to a resolution of their diabetes condition. Yep. So long term, it's changed their health outcome for the better. For the better. Um, so that was actually a real challenge because in the first year, the number of procedures went down and everyone was like, because the criteria is too tight. But in actual fact, what had happened was um, more people were getting referred. They may not have been suitable at the time, and they were, um, there was a two, two pathways. One, they were not clinically fit to have the care, and they needed a bit longer in other um, streams of care. So we actually had to fund that other pathway, and they, there was a, sort of a, a way forward for that. And the second point was some of the patients actually opted out because they saw what the procedure would take for them to be in it. So you were saying they, they had to actually sit and watch a video of what it was? Yes. Yeah. What, so can what you take, what so did they have to, what was that video and what did they, it show I, them? <laughs> the procedure. Right. <laughs> so it was the procedure and it was um, other people's experiences of that procedure. And uh, so some actually opted out and said, no, I'm not going to change my ways. This is yeah. not going to. And it was actually a discussion that was both clinical and a patient perspective about yeah. what it meant for them rather on, than yeah. an ongoing way yeah. because that's something you, yeah it's going to be a complete change to their, their, their lifestyle way of life. and how they that's right. so so from a patient outcome point of view having them being informed about the procedure and what life would look like once you have this is, is it so our first evaluation um, came up last December and you know it's it's escaped my mind at the moment but the the leaning was improvement but we're still not yet getting that resolution of the diabetes, obviously, but it's still on that path. But I think what it's actually done is expanded a pathway for people to actually discuss their diabetes management in a different way. We have plenty of diabetes education programs around the state, a lot of investment in the actual mm. program. But at the, at the pointy end for these particular patients referred, it has changed what happens for them. And what about the other panellists who, uh, some of you were talking about uh, your experience with bariatric procedures as well? well um, in our situation, um, so um, my hospital's part of the statewide bariatric service and we have a bundled payment. 
So the bundle payment ensures that the patient gets the, the pre-op and the post-op you know, workups to make sure that we, um, we're, we're delivering the right care. And as part of the pre-op wor workup, we do a psychological assessment, we do a dietetic assessment, and the patient has, has to be able to prove that they can lose weight just a small amount, but they have to be able to comply to that. And there's multiple assessments happen. Through that process, we lose quite a lot of patients who never actually make it to surgery. So that's one of the things that is the big learnings is most patients who apply for bariatric surgery don't actually get their surgery. And then post-op, we have to look after them quite a bit. And the bundled payment means that we make sure that all the elements are there. Um, again, Rob audits us for what who gets onto the list, and then once they get onto the list, how well they do afterwards. So the, um, the program's audited by the state as well. And I think it's really successful because the payment means that we get, that, you know, the patient gets the services, but also too, it mandates the interventions that are required and sets the criteria. And Richard? Uh, not my area of expertise, I'll yeah. admit that, but uh, I know that we do have a, a number of services who provide a statewide service both in Victoria, uh, sorry, in Melbourne and also country Victoria. And similar to the other jurisdictions, we provide a, a specified grant that covers the additional costs of these patients. So and I know that we do have similar pathway requirements for the patients to go to access. So we've got another interesting question here. This one's from Barb Vernon, and uh, Barb says, Jason Sutherland showed us this morning how the per patient costs can be significantly reduced when acute services have the flexibility to deliver care at home following an admission. So what are the states doing in this direction to deliver the more care at home? So within our funding model, if I go there, we've actually, um, some people call it a penalty, or looking at coal in the audience, that's a penalty. Um, but we pay a rate of 85% uh, for that particular patient who's managed at home as a hospital right. in the home, yep. when we know the cost is at a rate of about 60%. So there's a, there's, there is a margin in it. Um, so <laughs> but because it's not the 100%, because we're not in the infrastructure, it's, uh, it's kind of sending mixed messages around it. Yeah. So it, it does happen. We, we do a similar approach and, and from a funding model perspective. We pay on the, on the waste payment and then there's a, a HITH loading that we pay on top for um, the, the, the HITH time that they're at home. And and WA has a slightly different model in that we have a very large silver chain uh, model of care and so a lot of those um, ambulatory sensitive you know, conditions, we just refer them to, from ED particularly to home. So DVTs, um, cellulitis, those, you know, some of the UTIs, you can send them straight home on those sort, you know, for those sorts of conditions. But the funding model is actually as separate, it's the we just send them straight into community, and so I think some of this stuff is just cultural and what you're used to. So they don't even see, they don't get an admission from us at any stage in the process. So we've got lots of great questions. So I'm going to go through as many of them as we can. Uh, here's one from Julia Hume. She says, if Chris asks if Christine Bennett's National Health Reform Commission opened its doors on the 1st of July 2019, would a panel member like to nominate themselves as at the conference as an inaugural commissioner. Yeah. As Denise, so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. You can tell Denise I, she's don't hired. Don't film that. Yeah, she's hired. <laughs> no. um, so yeah, that's a funny. One. So uh, this is another good question, and we talked about this yesterday about hospital avoidance. So it's Umesh Goal asks, what's being done for hospital avoidance, and how is it being funded? Uh, and the, the it says here when hospital avoidance actually means less revenue for the hospital. hospital. And it should mean less cost as yeah. well. Yes. So it should actually mean less cost uh, and the, uh, the acuity in the hospital is going to go up. But for us, uh, we fund hospital avoidance through the model. There's, there's, there's a way to fund it. And um, if the hospitals are not capturing it, they need to let us know. But also, if your activity is decreasing, but we haven't seen it yet, that's, we need to have a discussion. So that's about the point of have you put in a program that is actually turning off services out of your hospital, therefore that would contract your services? That's not necessarily a bad thing, yes. and then you have to right size for that. In a, it, the challenge is um, our workforce is predominantly fixed, so we can't really do you know, change, so we're waiting for natural attrition. So that's about a, nego that's a negotiation and a discussion you have with the contract manager, I think, in that sense. But if someone's not capturing the activity, you need to come and speak to me. 
<laughs> we have Richard. our HARP program that's been around for many, many years, which is an avoidance program. So can you, I mean, I mean, maybe everyone in the audience may not know that program. Can you tell us a little bit about how it works? So it, it provides hospitals with a, a fixed level of funding per, per patient, mm -hmm. and it's designed to engage in a number of, of, of activities that would um, tailored to meet the needs of the patient, so it's not something that we're prescriptive in terms of what we're expecting from, from the health services, but it gives them a bit of flexibility to tailor for those patients and to hopefully avoid um, coming into the hospital. And Rob and, or Amanda, can you talk about what hospital avoidance programs do, do you have and, um, and how they're funded? So probably your question. Yeah, I mean, mind. what I can talk, well, I might take a different response. I might actually talk about the Sustainable Health Review that's just been released by our government. <clears throat> and this was a, a review of about 12 months, maybe longer, maybe 18 months, which was headed up by Robin Cruck, who many in the audience would know. And one of the key themes that came out of this time and time again through the 30 recommendations is the need to move away from hospital-based um, services as much as possible, move into the preventative health space, um, but also to just build those networks with primary health and look at alternative models. So we have um, a mandate for the next, this, in the, the near future, I think some of the um, recommendations need to be met by December, but certainly there's even horizon pieces. Which, so we're looking very much in WA about how we, we move into that space on a, on a large scale. I think the challenge is going to be, and this is always, I think we discussed this earlier, it's always going to be convincing the likes of Treasury and System Manager, who I represent, to just hand over money without the ability to define and, and calculate uh, and <laughs> quantify what's going on, particularly if you're handing it out to organisations which are not within your governance. So mm. these are things that we're going to have fun dealing with the next few years. Okay. Um, there's another good question uh, here. It says, activity-based funding is at times criticised for re rewarding activity and ignoring other aspects of, um, say, high-quality care such as prevention. So how can, how can that be tackled at a state level? It's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> How can it be? So are there, are there things you can put into place to, to overcome that or to mediate that? So in terms of prevention, I think this is another aspect of uh, maturity of the model. Mm -hmm. So we've been going on the ABF path for quite a while now and that's well defined. It's well understood mostly. Um, but it does actually lead to, we can't keep growing this beast. We need to actually do something better yeah. outside of this frame to stop people coming in. And what are the areas of um, disease or particular practices that we need to turn off? Is, you know, is it the social risks or the social factors, um, the patient characteristics that need to be changed? And that conversation is very real. And in, in our state, it's you know, the establishment of the wellness um, focus across the state and a whole change. There's a whole you know, workforce building up around this, which is in, instead of you know, treatment, it's more about prevention and so wellness. Can you um, t just take us through a little bit about what that looks like, the, the shift to a more of a wellness model? So it is about identifying what what factors are we going to address to prevent deterioration, I suppose, is actually right. that, that, that change. that change. And it comes, a lot of it's linking into um, housing and the social mm. Um, mm -hmm. conditions. It comes back to your question earlier about data linkage as well. I mean, if we can identify those social determinants of health, early on and put in place programs to address those, then we should see the, the benefits realised. Yeah. Yeah. But it, again, it's that leap of faith explaining to those who hold the funds to say, you're not going to see this in the near term, you're going to see mm. it down, down the track. The track. Yeah. Do you want, um, just another comment, James Down is used to me saying this, is that if we collect all this ABF data, it's all fever service, you know, um, episodes of care data in all the different parts, but if we align the classification systems, we can have a population-based growth. And then we actually know where the disease is yeah. and how it all works. And I know there's a lot of people who are very worried about what that actually means, but I'm gonna put my plug in, you know, before I'm 99, I'd like to see a population-based grouper because then we'd really understand the health status mm. of the nation. Yeah, that sounds, that's a good point. Um, so this is another good question and um, a couple of people have asked questions on this, along this line. So it says, this is from Jesse. Uh, do you think the state-based variance in rolling out um, hacks enhances or hinders their effectiveness? And Cathy Jones says, great question, Jesse. <laughs> so who'd like to tackle that one? How well, we've rolled it out. Yes. 
So oh, the, the, the variants. Oh, well, let's talk about the variants. So yep. in Queensland, in our um, state model, um, hospital acquired complications in terms of the calculation and view of the funding adjustment is across all admitted patients, and we rolled that in the first year. Um, what happens in Victoria? So we're, we're doing a shadow approach in the first year uh, in terms of that. So we've introduced a hack adjustment to our, to our WIS model. Uh, and um, in, in line with the national model, so we're meeting those obligations. Um, but we're actually not doing a funding adjustment at this mm. point in time, we're, we're shadowing it. And uh, we're and also- How long will you do that for, Richard? That's not my call. Okay. Um, people much higher than me make that decision. Um, and we're also working closely with Safer Care Victoria in terms of the other, in, other things that can be done in terms of, of supporting a reduction in, in, in the number of hacks. So I think there's been a lot of discussion about the effectiveness of applying a price adjustment and whether or not that's going to be sufficient to drive behaviour. And I think certainly the feedback that we've had is that there needs to be other policy um, incentives in place to actually drive the clinician and also the administrator's um, behaviour. And what about the West Australian so, experience? Um, so we've taken a somewhat blunt approach. Um, We've fully passed on the, the IPA WOW adjustment, so that obviously flows through in terms of um, the WOWs. But we've also, um, and the HSPs love us for this, we've we've taken a base year, in this case 1718. We'd been collecting condition onset flags and so forth for a long time, so we had some good data there already. We've taken that base rate to each health service, health service provider and said, based on that base rate, um, that case mix, and the case mix we expect you to have next year, this is the quantum of funding we're removing. Um, if you improve after, so in that year, after six months, we'll do a reconciliation and hand back the difference. So the onus is on them to um, show improvement in the hacks. Yep. But we're also using hacks, should I say, we've also got a cut down set of about five. These were determined by the by clinical reference group and we use those in a performance space every month. So <coughs> the issue is always with coding. We have this, I'm sure everyone in the room has this issue with the lag in coding. So um, the hack adjustment in terms of funding adjustment is essentially 18 months after the fact, right. but the performance conversation is very real and it's every month. Fantastic. So if is you have any questions from the audience, if you want to raise your hand, we've got a couple of roving mics. Where are our roving microphones? Can I tack on, yeah, in go, terms Tony. of the actual yeah. practical application, because yeah. um, the way our contracts work each year, we never actually remove money mm -hmm. unless there's a, a ending of a program of funding. Um, but the hospital acquired complication adjustment had an impact because we calculate a productivity dividend so you might actually have to do more with the same money because you have greater hacks so it's kind of like a double it is whammy so you need to clean up your act because <laughs> it's a double whammy on that sense yeah yep. Amanda? So I'm going to make a comment because um, I started um, because I started on one of the early hack reference groups um, once we realised what they were, and then we could start measuring them, we've been chasing them for a couple of years now, so before it came in, and we've improved um, performance just at a site level just by getting clinician engagement and having the clinical conversation. So we never really discussed the money, we just discussed the care. So you don't um, need to go to that next step. Of and so I think that that's, if you do that, and I want Cathy Jones' portal, yeah. please. <laughs> I'm with Ramsey. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, back in the day, we used to talk about chatx, didn't we? And that was yes. the mm. precursor to chatx. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's another good question here. Uh, are there other? And this, I think this is referring to what you were talking about, Tony, about the diabetes and losing weight. Um, are there other lifestyle choices that could be linked into funding to improve health outcomes, such as, for example, like smoking cessation? Oh, so Queensland are asking that question, is it? Because the we have an incentive payment for um, capturing smoking cessations and. We've changed that each year to sort of address gaps we see in the, um, the health status of our population. So how, just take us, how does that work? How does the incentive payment work? How does it actually work? Well, the, there has to be a um, discussion with the patient about ceasing smoking. And this year's, well, is it this year or next year? I get confused because we're always working on last year, this year and next year at mm -hmm. any given time. Um, but we're actually looking at um, the discussion with uh, Indigenous mothers, right. pregnant, because I think we've got a 20% smoking rate in that population versus 5 to 7 in non-Indigenous, so it's 
hugely impacting our population. So uh, there's an incentive payment for actually having that discussion and a plan. Right. And mm -hmm. have you, is that, how successful has that been? So the actual program itself has been very successful and that's why it's been able to actually be <laughs> narrowed down to a specific patient yeah. cohort. Yeah. Okay. What about in the other states? Um, anything similar like that? Mm, no, certainly not in, in the Victorian model. And what about in West Australia? Um, no, not, not like that. I, mean, I can talk about some other stuff we do. I mean, we've, yeah, sure. We've overhauled our outcome-based management framework now so that we have enormous numbers of indicators which link funding, uh, and it's reported in annual reports, so the Treasury monitor this, it links funding to outcomes. Um, and there's, I don't, know, I don't know how many indicators, there's lots of them. <laughs> um, we try and align that to our monthly conversations in performance meetings, so we have quite a robust KPI um, regime, and that's open to all the HSPs. They can all see each other's results within their own HSP. They can drill down to patient level uh, detail, and it's quite, it's quite, as I say, robust. It's quite detailed. And so, what sort of difference do you think it makes that it is so open and transparent? It makes me worry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I look. It's two sides to this. One is that it actually drives competition, and that is along with transparency in terms of naming and shaming, but also wanting to be the best, are two of the greatest drivers for performance. They're, yes. they're neither a stick or a carrot, I guess, but it's how the individuals respond. So I think it, it certainly helps. But it also helps drive improvement, because they can look at each other and they can call each other up and say, what are you doing on this? Things like that people don't even think about in the ABS space, stuff like discharging against medical advice, immunisation right. rates, um, follow-ups from mental health admissions, all those things which are really difficult they can actually have a conversation with each other and say, well, what's going on here? How are you tackling here? that? Yeah. 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 So we, we have a very, very detailed KPI regime around these yeah. things. We, we have similar performance reporting that goes out monthly, and, and we also make our cost data available yep. to health totally. services to, um, to benchmark against each other. Okay, excellent. So don't forget, if you want to ask a question, oh, we've got a question down here. Um, while we're getting to this gentleman, I'll just ask, Shane Solomon had a question. Um, He's asked, do you think we should have national data collection of PROMs? But maybe we could say, what impact would it have if we did have that, Tony, if we, if we collected the patient reported outcomes? I think we should have patient reported outcome measures all the time. And it's, act, it, it's actually the discussion with the patient, do you want to interact and advise? Because it's, you know, if you're a, if you're a client, you're going to have to fill in the documentation. Yeah because that's where it needs to come from. And like a lot of measures always come from the clinical perspective, but we want to ch actually change it to the patient actually doing their, their scores. There's lots of scales and scores. Because I think, I know in New South Wales that they are doing more of that. And I think the uptake has been quite high mm -hmm. for, in terms of the number of patients filling in the, the card. And I remember I actually had a procedure and then I was given um, that card when I was just about to be discharged, asking me about my experience. And I was like, Oh, someone, that, someone actually cares about how how this went, other than you know me and my family. But someone else is actually really interested in in whether this was a good experience or not. And I, I felt that, and I'm sure other patients would feel the same. Could we put it through my health record? Yeah, that's yeah, that would be a good you're, idea. You're booked in for a procedure. Do you want to fill it out now? Blah blah blah. And it actually goes back to the patient and the organisation. So it's actually linked. That would so be they nice. Could opt, patients <laughs> could opt in to put it into their My Health record. Yeah. yeah. And what does the rest of the panel think? We'll, we'll go to you in a second. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. Mm. I think it's, it makes sense that we've seen the benefits through other national data collections and get, getting some sort of measure of comparability. And I think it would be useful to have something on as the that has that uh, that has some sort of national consistency about it. So we'll go over here. I think it's on. Just to hold it nice and close. again. Good. Oh, there we go. Cole from Darling Downs. Um, we're all under activity pressure. Our activity is increasing all of the time. For us, most of that activity comes from emergency medical presentations, and those presentations are from people in chronic <coughs> disease groups. Is there an argument for carving out those chronic disease groups entirely from um, the ABF funding and managing that, those groups of care so that the balance of the activity at those acute facilities and whatever is better, and you can target your prevention method, methods better. Yeah, so who, who would like to address that? Because I think we, <laughs> I think I would, I discussed with some Goes of the panel and some of the previous panels yeah. about the, 
the, the issue that ABF is not great for chronic care and it tends to, people be, end up in emergency departments, they get treated and they get sent home and they end up back there again. So, so for, for this proposal, what, how much better would it be if there was that money hived off for chronic disease management? Well, to a certain extent, that's what we're doing now with the Health Links project in terms of, um, and, and whilst I, it, it's looking at the acute admitted environment, it, it does actually extend further with the idea is that we will we'll try to reduce the number of times the patients come back for an admitted episode. Quite often that will come through an admission through the emergency department. And so um, I think this is a, an example where, where we can start to look at using that funding and try to address some of those issues um, before the patient comes into the ED or, or through, the, um, through other mechanisms. And I know some of the anecdotal stories there's one in particular about a person who at Barwon who was presenting quite frequently through the ED. The Health Links intervention, I think, resulted in her no longer attending the ED, uh, and as a consequence, um, addressing those sorts of issues that I think you were raising. So I think there's opportunities to to think about broadening the scope of the funding, not necessarily from the inpatient environment, but also looking at perhaps ED funding and maybe even non-admitted funding to making it more flexible and more tailored to try and address these patients a lot sooner in that, uh, in that journey. Look, we're, we're almost out of time for this session, so I thought I might just briefly go to the panel just to give us any, to each of you give it any last thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience about your experience with, with ABF and what, what you'd like to their sort of t the take home message to be from, from your experience. <coughs> Rob? <laughs> um, give you time to think about it. <laughs> thanks. Um, Look, I'll go back to what I said originally. I think ABF is a, is a resounding success, um, if only because of the transparency and the ability to look at consistent data across the whole nation, even within our health services. If we, if we didn't have that, we'd still be back in the early days of case mix, mucking around, trying to work out if, what, you know, if that lemon is consistent with this pear or apple. And, and it's, so it's, it's been enormously successful in that regard. It's enabling us to do some work now on things like um, low value healthcare, so we're doing some real research around this. We can, because there's an ABF model, we can now look at some very easy ways to discourage um, low value healthcare. It's quite simple, you zero weight something or you put in a marginal price equivalent weight. Without that kind of framework, it's very difficult, um, short of having a very big stick to say, stop doing these things. So I think it's been a tremendous success. Amanda? And for, for me, the big success is, again, having consistent data across all the domains of care. Um, and again, my population pays grouper type mentality is that but we need to then use that as just the starting point of how we provide care in the future. Because for those who do provide care on the ground, it's not just about the, the clinical <laughs> side of it, the, the home based um, non-clinical aspects of the care become very important and we need to tie tie those social someone's uh, those social parts of the care together until we do that we will still have a bit of a revolving door we've got a, a quick question from the audience before we go on to Richard and Tony Get. it's not on oh, oh yes <laughs> it is on quick question though we don't uh, it probably is not going to be quick uh, so uh, I'm a health information manager so I've got a sort of a coding based question uh, I'm hearing from the panel that they're talking about uh, wellness, well-being, uh, social determinants of health, socio-economic factors, and I work at uh, Veterans Affairs and we're looking at the same model. Uh, I was having a conversation with my colleagues here who do mental health coding and they capture uh, what we call Z codes, which are social impacts on uh, admissions, so things like homelessness, uh, living alone, etc. But because they're now being audited, and they, these codes don't meet the standards for being coded, they're not being captured. But they commented it's not telling the full story of why someone took so long. Is this a, a, a point in time now that IPA's taking over the um, development of the coding standards that we should relook at those, capturing those social codes? So that's quite a technical question. Who would that's like to? That's a really to, good question. It's a really good question. Mm. Who would like good to question. have it? Oh, I give it to James. Yeah, it's question. All right, well, James is coming up. <laughs> James is coming up James, soon. James so is nodding. And James is coming up soon. So we'll just go to Richard and Tiny for last words. I was going to, yeah. I was going to say, and for the state, if that's really required, would you do it at the state and then just leave the records in the state? We'd still keep going and then send them without. 
yeah. to meet right. the criteria. I mean, there's, there, there, there's no need for <laughs> there's ways around it. National reporting and state reporting are two Can different, be different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we collect more information than potentially what's required nationally, but I think, you know, we, 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 we're seeing that there is a need for this information. We need to, to look at it um, and, and the data collection a little bit differently to, to sort of meet the, the needs of the community. And I think these sorts of issues in terms of picking up these determinants and making sure that they're consistently reported um, is, is one of the biggest challenges that we have. And I think we, we see that time and time again, that there, there can be nuances in how things are coded. Um, and that, that from, a, from my perspective, when it comes through to me from funding policy, trying to understand that variance that might occur because of some of these issues does cause us a bit of a challenge. But ideally, yes, would be my, my comment. And Tony, do you have any last thoughts and take home messages for the audience? Um, I think personally, it's been thank you for a really interesting career. Every day you learn something new, and every day you learn how you didn't do it right <laughs> as well. Um, Looks having a growth I, mindset and learning from your mistakes. Yes, all the time. Um, and, you know, I get the price wrong every year, that sort of thing. <laughs> but then in terms of the, um, the change, I think the change right now really is it's not a desktop exercise. It's actually on the ground meeting with patients, meeting with the clinicians, and asking them to give you the solutions mm rather than us trying to impose it. It's really interesting dynamic. That's the change, I think. And before I say, uh, thank, get you to thank our panel, I just wanted to um, thank everyone in the audience for being here um, and taking the time. It's been you know, a couple of days, and we know you all have very busy lives, and it's uh, been fantastic that you could all attend this, this really important event. And I think as an outsider coming into this, uh, this space, even though I work in health, um, not so much in health economics. I think what's been so gratifying for me is just to see the, the focus on, on quality, on safety, and also increasingly on, on having patient reported outcomes and having the patient at the center of all the discussion and all the decisions. So um, I'd just like to say, keep up the great work that you're all doing. And uh, thank you for being here for the last few days. And uh, please thank our panel, give them a round of applause. <laughs> please stay here.